stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of The Whisper in Darkness. I'm your host, the man from Lang. Thank you very much for joining me today. Welcome back to Farcom Con 2020. This is, uh, we are uh, streaming here. We've got uh, an interview with uh, author Richard Lee Byer queued up here for, uh, for your uh, listening pleasure today. This is uh, a chance encounter. Uh, my uh, segment that I usually do where I interview uh, authors and uh, other personalities in the uh, Arkham Horror LCG community. Before I get started, I just want to uh, thank everybody for tuning in, as well as uh, remind you that uh, there are a ton of events taking place during FarcomCon 2020. You can head over to uh, the FarcomCon uh, webpage, uh, where you can see the full schedule of events. There are a ton of events taking place uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday the, after the con kicked off yesterday. So do uh, head over there. You can also check out the Farcom Con 2020 Discord server, which has uh, uh, updates on, uh, on events that are taking place. As for the Whisper in Darkness channel, we have uh, our interview with Richard Lee Byer, which we're going to get to here in a minute. And we've also got uh, tomorrow. We have the uh, the Whisper in Darkness uh, community appreciation stream. I'll be doing uh, a live show with uh, my counterparts over at Great Old Ones Gaming in the afternoon, and that will be followed by uh, the Whisper in Darkness presents Curtain Call, the uh, my uh, interpretation of the uh, Curtain Call scenario from the Path to Carcosa for the uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, seventh edition RPG. If you miss out on that one on Saturday night, there will also be uh, a session on Sunday night as well. And uh, don't forget, on Sunday I will be uh, running a table of Labyrinths of Lunacy in uh, conjunction with uh, Lost in Time and Space and Optimal Play. I also want to remind you about the My Tentacle Face contest that is uh, taking place. We've already received some entries of players who have uh, submitted their tentacle face to the Man From Lang uh, uh, Facebook page, the Whisperer in Darkness channel. So if you haven't already done so, head over there, post a picture of your uh, face uh, that you uh, have when you draw a tentacle from the Chaos Bag and uh, with the hashtag MyTentacleFace and you'll be... Uh, you will have a chance to win the grand prize, which is a, uh, a copy of all of the Investigator starter decks from the uh, product that will be released this month. And uh, we will also have uh, three other prizes for the uh, tentacle faces that receive the most uh, likes. Uh, there will be a copy of the uh, Barkham Horror standalone expansion, a copy of the Forgotten Age upgrade expansion, and... Uh, and a copy of the Blood of Balshandor, which uh, will be signed by uh, Richard Lee Byer. So if you have any interest in uh, getting in on those and winning yourself some uh, great uh, prizes, head over to the Whisper in Darkness channel on Facebook and uh, post a picture for my tentacle face. Before we get uh, started with the interview, I just want to thank the uh, patrons of the channel for their tremendous support. The uh, Arkham Horror LCG community is amazing and these people have gone above and beyond to bring you uh, content like these, uh, like this interview as well as reviews, playthroughs, and uh, all the other stuff I do here on the channel. If you'd like to become a patron of the channel and support the channel's goals, head over to patreon.com, sign up for a tier of your choice, and claim your rewards. That would be awesome. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, chat with uh, Richard Lee Byer, author of The Ire of the Void and uh, The Blood of uh, Balshandor novellas for the Arkham, L Arkham Horror LCG. How are you, Richard? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Good thank to be you. here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining me today. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you uh, how you got into writing. You've got a, a quite a background of uh, uh, of uh, books under your uh, under your belt. Yeah, well, I always kind of had it in my head I would be a writer of fantastic fiction because I discovered it at an early age and I really liked it. And I kind of knew I had some verbal ability and some imagination, so I thought it'd be a good fit for me. But um, as I was growing up, you know, everybody told me that, um, you know, it's really hard to make a living as a as a writer and uh, you should have another 
you should have like kind of a real job and then they have writing to fall uh, as kind of a sideline. And, um, you know, that's kind of realistic advice, but it's also, at least in my case, sure, that'd be really bad advice because I went into um, psychology and uh, eventually wound up working in the mental health field. And I found it so draining that when I would come home at night, I wouldn't really have any energy left to write a story. So I, uh, for a number of years, I really didn't do anything with writing, but I got burned out on mental health uh, stuff. And uh, my mom passed away and left me some money that I could live on for a while. And I said, well, if I'm ever going to do it, now's the time to do it. I either need to do it now or accept that I'm never going to do it. So I um, quit the job and started trying to write. And after, uh, after a while, I made, uh, started making sales to uh, small, uh, couple sales to a small press magazine and then uh, a novel to a very small press kind of publisher and everything just kind of bloomed from there. And uh, I was originally started out doing uh, horror novels and, but this was in the late eighties and the horror market uh, really collapsed at around 1989, 1990. And, um, so I was looking for something else to do and I kind of drifted into doing um, tie in fiction and have done a lot of that since, although I've returned to doing my own stuff from time to time. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've written for, for properties like the Forgotten Realms and, and, uh, as well as the, uh, the Arkham Horror LCG. What was your, what was the, how long did it take you before you, you sort of felt like you, you had made it as an author? Oh, uh, I don't know. There are days when I'm still not sure I made it as an author. Um, I mean, it was, um, you know, it was a, a thing that go, went by degrees. I mean, I, the first things I sold, like I said, were um, a couple stories to a small press magazine. And um, then I sold um, a couple novels to a very small publisher that, that went under. And then uh, I sold a horror novel to uh, Zebra Books. And then I kind of felt like, okay, now I'm getting somewhere. I had a couple more horror novels come out. Like I said, the horror market collapsed, and then I was like, well, maybe I'm done. But uh, I set my sights on tie-in fiction and started selling some of that, and um, it, it that increased my confidence again. And I, it went on from, but periodically when the wheels come off, was that, you know, the, I'll still think, well, holy shit, maybe it's over. You know, they found me out. <laughs> So, what was your uh, introduction to H.P. Lovecraft and the Cthul and the Cthulhu Mythos? Uh, well, I mentioned that I liked fantastic fiction from an early age, and uh, one of the uh, really my first introduction to it, I think, was a couple books I found um, on my grandparents' bookshelf. And I don't know what they were doing there because my grandparents weren't big readers of fantastic fiction by any stretch of the imagination, but um, one of them was. Uh, a book called The Best Supernatural Stories of H.P. Lovecraft. So I devoured that at a young age, and uh, that, that got me interested in uh, Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos, and I've remained interested ever since. So do you have a, a favorite story? You know, I've always liked the Dunwich Horror. There's just something about that story that really, uh, I don't know, that really got to me. I mean, I like a lot of his stories, but... Um, that one, I don't know. There's just something about it. I think maybe it's because the guys go out and fight the monster at the end, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of a go out and fight the monster kind of guy, as opposed to a um, just a oh look how awful it is, and now it's going to get the, the the protagonist kind of a guy. Yeah, some people I know they have uh, they have uh, trouble with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's language, just because he he wrote in a fairly. Uh, archaic style that may have even been archaic at his <laughs> when he was writing it uh, that was never a, an obstacle for you well i think that um there are a lot of writers who are best discovered when you're at a certain age and uh, i don't think it's a big knock on them to say that that's the case and i would say lovecraft was one of those writers i read it at an age where um I really responded to the way he used language and, and, and I thought it was really cool and different. I have to admit that sometimes I go back and I read a passage of Lovecraft now and I think, geez, that's a little much, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, but uh, it, it think it you know, I think that it's a great thing to read uh, at a certain age when, um, 
at a certain age when uh, his you, you're very much impressed by his storytelling virtues and not as conscious of his storytelling weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm a big fan of the uh, of the uh, the Call of Cthulhu short story. Uh, I just I, I love the way that how he develops it using <clears throat> excuse me using the sort of the box of leftover letters as the hook that that everything spirals out from and of course he I mean he tries to hit Cthulhu with a boat which <laughs> which yeah. is not something that happens uh, happens yeah. in every story. Do you have That's any another of his really strong stories? I think I really like that one too. Yeah. Do you have any other favorite authors who have uh, dabbled in the in the mythos? Well, I like um, you know I like a lot of the stories from the uh, kind of weird tales circle. You know his pen pals uh, that um, are mythos stories at least to some degree. Uh, of more contemporary writers, I think that um, Ramsey Campbell is just a genius. I love his work, including his work in the mythos. Uh, I really like uh, uh, Thomas Ligotti as kind of a writer of existential cosmic horror. To me, one of the... I mean, I know Ligotti is not a like a, like a purely mythos writer in the sense that he uses the, the, the names of the specific gods and the, the grim grimoires and the, and the place names and things like that. But I kind of, I like the, um, I like cosmic horror that, um, is being written today that, um, gets at, uh, Lovecraft's underlying themes and, uh, and ideas in perspective, but doesn't necessarily use the specific mythos gods and, um, and monsters and stuff like that. Cause I think that, it can be hard to actually scare a reader with those because they've been on stage so many times. They, mm -hmm. they are li more likely to inspire nostalgia than, um, than horror. Now, that's not always the case. There's some people that uh, use them and, and use them brilliantly today and, and still manage to scare you. But um, I, I, I think that's a harder game to play. Yeah, yeah. The... Uh... It's it's I, I think uh, I mean it's it's been interesting I know when I discovered Lovecraft back in in I think it was eighty nine I think the first story I read was Rats in the Walls and it just creeped the living hell out of me yeah uh, but then you know it's back then it was you didn't really it, like Lovecraft seemed to be more more niche and now there's there's so it's seems to be have a, a much greater presence in in popular culture and and whatnot to the point that some people are like okay we're we're done with <laughs> we're done with the cthulhu mythos it's everywhere now can we please uh take a step back yeah well i think that when south park did its three-part story that involved cthulhu mythos you know saturation was pretty much complete mm -hmm. yeah Although well, they did a really good job with it. That's a really good three-part stuff part story. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I think they've got the new show on HBO. I think it's Lovecraft Country or something like that. They've they've had a... Yeah, I, yeah. it uh, starts in a couple weeks, I think. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, to see what they do with uh, what they do with that. So how did you uh, how did you get involved with uh, writing for uh, for Fantasy Flight and uh, and the Arkham Horror LCG novels? Okay, well I um, I think that um, maybe they I always have trouble answering these questions because I have trouble remembering after a certain point how I got involved in doing something. But I think maybe there was an open call, and um, I submitted ideas or something. I, I could be wrong about that. They could have. Just flat out invited me, but I don't think so. Um, I've, I've done a lot of um, a lot, just love crafting fiction myself that is um, not officially Arkham Horror or anything. It's just, you know, mythos fiction. And somebody might have noticed that I had done that and, and, and approached me. But boy, I'm really blanking on it, to be honest. So, how does it feel to, to be an author contributing to that? To that body of work because it is it is very much a shared a shared universe and and was encouraged to be so from the very beginning yeah well i think that it's um it's a little 
it's exciting and it, because the ideas are so strong and continue to resonate. And it's also a little bit intimidating because um, like I said, so many excellent writers have contributed excellent work to it. Um, I think the big challenge of it is to uh, try to find something that's a little different than what's been done before that's true to the spirit of it. Nonetheless, like, um, you know, I, I think that, um, I, th I think that Lovecraft fiction and the Cthulhu mythos is great, but there probably isn't a crying need for, a, you know, another story about an antiquarian that moves into the wrong old house, you know, and, and yeah. suffers accordingly. I think we've kind of got those. So I, I try to, when I do a Lovecraftian story, I try to, you know, come up with a little something that, that I, I feel is, um, extends the, the, the tropes or considers the implications of the mythos in a way that hasn't been done before or something like that. Yeah, so that brings me to to talking about the the first book he wrote for the for the novella was uh, Ire of the Void featuring uh, Norman Withers. How did you what sort of process did you go through to write that to avoid those those classic pitfalls of the because he is very much a, a sort of the older gentleman who who could potentially move into the wrong house and and have uh, events transpire. Yeah, well, I wanted to, um, you know, the first step in doing that once they, I found out they were open to a story for me was to um, pick a character, and I knew a lot of other writers were picking characters at the same time, so I looked at the ones that hadn't already been done because the brief was to do do the origin story of this particular character, basically. How does he become a mythos investigator? And I thought Norman was kind of interesting because he was very much kind of not a man of action. So I thought that um, probably other people weren't picking him. So I was on safe ground if I pitched a story about him. And, uh, but, you know, he was an astronomer and I thought that a scientist and I thought that was interesting because I always kind of liked the way that uh, the mythos ties the supernatural and science together. And uh, so I, I wanted, thought, well, it'd be fun to do a story that kind of leans into the science part. And I always knew that I, I always knew that my, one of my very favorite mythos related monsters was the Hound of Tin, Hounds of Tindalos. And I thought, you know, they hadn't, they had been, a lot of good stories have been written that explore them, but uh, there were still things that you could potentially reveal about them or show them op or show them in a way they hadn't been shown before which had turned out to be um, actually we're going to um, go into the realm that they're in when they're not coming out of the corner and eating somebody in the, the material world. And uh, I had not seen a story like that before. There might be one out there somewhere, but I hadn't read it. So uh, I, I put all that together and, and went with that. So did you, did you have a pretty good idea for the, how the story was going to unfold when you made the, the pitch? Yeah, you. Uh, a lot of times, what you have to. I mean, a lot of times they want to see. A, they want to see a reasonably. Um, assuming they're interested in the the pitch. The first pitch is usually pretty short, although I've broken that rule sometimes. And then if if they like it, they'll ask you to expand on it. And when the time you've expanded on it, you have a pretty good map of where the story's going to go. Yeah, I I have to admit that when I saw that Norman Withers was was one of the investigators that they had chosen to do a, a book about, that I was surprised because he's certainly not an investigator that has stood out to me in in many of the other Arkham uh, Arkham um, horror products, like in in the board game and and stuff like that. He's not not one that I immediately gravitated to. Well, sometimes it's kind of fun to do a story where um, where you you come up with, come up with a plot idea and then you uh, deliberately uh, pick a character that it's going to be really hard for him to cope. And Norman kind of falls into that category to a degree. So uh, that uh, that I think it all eventually leads you to a very strong story or a very suspenseful story because you're thinking, "Damn, how is this guy ever going to make it?" <laughs> Yeah, he's not exactly, uh, he's no athlete. Yeah. And a, uh, a telescope is not uh, not a machine gun. Yeah, I re ended up the story really liking it, if, if, and really liking him. If they ever, 
if they ever want a sequel, I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would read it. I I quite enjoyed the story. It, uh, like I said, it was he wasn't an investigator who who uh, resonated with me, but uh, but as I read it, it was. Uh, I think I think you managed to to sort of avoid that. Um, avoid that pitfall of just turning him into a, sort of a, a doddering old man who who sort of just stumbles into to all sorts of all sorts of problems yeah I, mean, I don't think that would have been an interesting story to read particularly or that they would have um, the, the editorial would have had any particular interest in it um what i tried to i i, I kind of downplayed his age i think to a degree i mean he's I mean, he doesn't have to be ancient. I mean, he's got the, kind of the white beard and everything in, in the portrait, but he, you know, he doesn't have to be doddering and infirmating. So I steered away from that, and I, to a certain degree, I uh, made his uh, his issues more emotional. You know, I found him at a very, uh, I pick him up at a very um, kind of depressed, isolated part in, point in his life, and. Uh, you know, paradoxically, is by dealing with all these horrors that he kind of starts to come out of that. Right, and he, yeah, he starts living life again. So, how did uh, how did the story evolve as you were as you were writing it? Did you have a a pretty good idea from the very beginning where it was going to go? Or yeah, I knew that um, I knew that it was going to be about the um, the the Norman and the uh, young scientists from overseas and um, that the young scientist from overseas was going to get taken and that we were he was going to have to then to kind of try to deal with him that hopefully that's not giving away too many spoilers about the story but but yeah i, I knew where we i knew that we were um i knew that norman was going into the um out of ordinary reality in in pursuit of the hounds of Tendalos into their realm, and I kind of I kind of knew what that would be like and what would happen when he got there. So how did you how did you go about developing that? Because I know as having run some Call of Cthulhu RPGs, it's I always find it difficult to sort of describe the what is essentially an undescribable place. Like it it feels there it feels like it's supposed to be so alien and 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 difficult I, I think actually lovecraft does a pretty good job in call of cthulhu at toward the end when he describes relay sort of just focusing on things that should have happened like the the angles and whatnot how did you go about that well what i did was i um i went back to the original hounds of Tendala's story by frank belknap long and i um and he's got um you know, he tells you some things about what their realm is like, but it's all very kind of uh, vague and figurative. And I, uh, because the, you know, the, the character that's telling the story doesn't ever actually go there. And, um, but I took all that and I just kind of built on it and said, okay, well, what, what does this mean? What would it be like if you were really there? And this was true and uh, just extrapolated. Right, right. Do you have a, a, a favorite scene in the book? Um, let me think. Well, I, I kind of like the whole part where where the, the the back end part where Norman has gone into that other realm, uh, which I think is maybe we would say comprises more than one scene. If it's all one scene, it's a long scene. But uh, I really I really like that part. And uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm fond of the whole story. Yeah, I've I've noticed with the the novellas they tend to take place over over a very brief period of time. Like you're not telling life stories here. It's more like a just a snapshot of their life at a at a very um, brief moment of time. Both with with Norman as well as the the Dexter novella. I think Dexter yeah. takes place over like maybe twenty four hours or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's um yeah. Let me think. It's um. Yeah, it might, it might be just 24 hours. It, it's certainly not more than 48 hours. I'm trying to remember if I worked a sunset, a sunrise in there at some point or not. I don't. Maybe I didn't. Yeah, I don't think you did because they they they're at the the warehouse and then they're at the university and then maybe dawn is breaking. I think that's about as close as you get to a 
to, yeah, to yeah, a new I think day. That, I think that's about right. I think it all does happen in a very compressed period of time, which is um, which can be a way to kind of you know ratchet up the suspense and the tension. It's not the only way to do it, but um, it it can contribute to that. So, were there any scenes that you wanted to include in *Ire of the Void* that uh, you you just couldn't couldn't fit in due to the the space requirements? I imagine writing a novella is a pretty uh, you've you've got a limited amount of words to 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 get a story out. I there really weren't because I mean I've always been pretty good at um, coming up with uh, story ideas that uh, turn out to fit pretty much the parameters in terms of length. I, mean, I don't recall cutting anything. I, um, uh, or, or, or saying, you know, I just have to leave this out. I think, um, I think that if anything, I tend to, um, if anything, I tend to, uh, maybe get a little, a little long in terms of my scenes where my fight scenes or my mm-hmm. chase scenes, I've had editors come back and say, you know, could you, you know, like, cut this down a little bit because you know not everybody is as interested in the fight choreography of this as you are and uh there i don't know the editor might have said something like that with the with norman i know they said something like that with the dexter drag novella mm-hmm. and I, I took a little of the action stuff out of that one so it's not impossible it happened with the uh, of the void too well you, you did say that you're you're the kind of guy who likes to fight the monster so yeah <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and uh, tell me a little bit about the, the scene I, I liked in Ire of the Void was when, the, when Norman visits the man at his house and he's, he's set, up a, set up an elaborate trap, which... Oh, yeah, yeah. Which that, was, that I, I, that, I, I'm rarely creeped out, but that, I think the, that revelation was the one that I, I, I still remember where I, was re- where I was when I was reading it because I'd taken my son to gymnastics and I was reading this, I, I was reading the, the novella there and I got to that scene and I was just like, now this is, this is uh, Call of Cthulhu right here. Yeah, that was a fun scene. That was tense. I actually had to, uh, you know, sometimes you, as you're a writer, you find out that there's something that you always assumed you knew because it's very basic part of life and you didn't really know well enough to write the scene so i had to go out and research how doors are hinged <laughs> before i could write that <laughs> um, how does the hinge you know how does the hinge actually hang how does that work but right. uh, yeah that i mean that is um you know that is a, that was a, a fun scene to write because partly because you know you know that the tension's going to be there because he has literally only you know minutes to get out of there and uh also i mean those scenes of kind of uh you know, psychological manipulation are interesting where he's kind of, uh, he, he's trying to manipulate the guy that's holding him prisoner. Mm-hmm. We are, uh, talking to, uh, author Richard Lee Byer. He has written, uh, novellas for the, uh, Arkham Horror LCG. He's written two of them, Ira the Void, and, uh, most recently the, uh, the Blood of Balshandor. We'll be, uh, taking some questions from the chat, uh, toward the end of the uh, the interview so if you have any uh, anything you'd like to ask Richard uh, post it in the chat and we will do our best to uh, to uh, to ask it uh, Norman does have a brief a very brief cameo in uh, in the blood of Belshandor tell me a little bit about uh, the process that went on uh, for writing that one writing the, the book or the cameo uh, no the the book Oh, okay. Because the, the cameo is very the cameo brief. Was, there's very blink little if you fun. Miss it. I'm going to throw him in here. <laughs> uh, but uh, the book, well, that was, well, again, I was, uh, the first part was kind of picking which character I wanted to do. And I thought, well, I kind of picked the most unlikely character to do in Eye of the Void with Norman, as we've already discussed. And I thought, well, let's, well, second one, let's go the other way. Let's pick a very kind of uh, dashing uh you know, action more action-oriented character that you would think could give the um, mythos a good run for its money and uh, write about him. So uh, again, the brief was to do it his origin story, so it had to be um, sub, you know submerging him into the mythos and giving him a problem to deal with. And uh, that was a little more complicated because I found out there had already been a a book of um, 
kind of little brief stories about somebody's first encounter with the mythos, some of the investigators, and he was actually in that. So I couldn't I couldn't portray that him as a character that had never met the mythos before because it wouldn't have been consistent with it, what had already been presented. Right. So unfortunately, what did exist had um, it was kind of like a very minor brush with the mythos, and it still left it for me to really kind of you know have his first full blown serious you know do or die encounter with the mythos. So I went with that. And then I was looking for um, what would be an interesting, uh, you know, mythos antagonist for him. And uh, I'd actually found one that was in the um, in the material that uh, my editor had given me about, uh, you know, the, these are the resources you have for Arkham Horror. And I picked this one particular god. And then uh, they, Ed Bider came back to me and said, you know, that that the Bible's actually wrong in that regard. We don't have the rights to use that God, but you can make up your own God. And so I made up Baal Shandor, who was kind of, uh, who had the same essential qualities as the God that I was not able to use. And uh, it's probably a better story because I was able to just do whatever I thought was most appropriate rather than trying to take my idea and make sure it matched up with the other writer's idea. Right now, excellent though the other writer is. <laughs> yeah, so the I mean the the Necronomicon is one of the most iconic iconic books in in Lovecraft's writing, and it's it's appeared in countless countless properties at this point. But you uh, you had an uh, an opportunity with this to to add uh, your own uh, iconic tome to the uh, to the list with the with the Blood of Belshandor. How did you go about? Uh, so you you because you're sort of writing a book within a book at that point yeah well i again it was you know once i knew i was doing my own god and my own contribution mythos it just seemed kind of natural to have my my own special tome because i mean god knows there's enough of them right and um i i just you know i just could put whatever i wanted in it that supported the story so i, I did that and hopefully it's uh it's interesting and uh you know maybe somebody else will want to use it uh use that in their mythos adventure that they create or something but uh it was um you know it's pretty utilitarian in terms of uh, you know i need a book i'm gonna make up my own book and uh and uh one aspect of the story i think that, that helps the story is that uh you know it's it's not the Necronomicon, which has been stolen, which would be like this huge red flag, but it turns out to be a book that's very, very dangerous in its own right. Yeah, I, I was sort of the, unfolds. the the. I mean, the the. I think it's the very first sentence of the of the book. You you drop the Necronomicon in there, and I thought, <laughs> wow, <that's, laughs> yeah. we're just we're just jumping right in here with the yeah. with the big guns. But then it, I, I like how it turned out that he'd actually only seen a couple pages of it. You know, yeah. not not even the whole book, just just a few select pages that he had picked up. You know, on, yeah, on his which travels. is actually, I, as I recall, that's actually kind of consistent with um, that other short story that I was was trying to maintain consistency with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so did, I don't. Know, I just I just thought it was something. I just thought there was something inherently humorous about this uh kind of brash vaudevillian walking into the miskatonic university library and asking to see the necronomicon and so I, I i enjoyed writing that i don't know if it struck anybody else funny but i thought it was funny as i was doing it yeah yeah no it is it's it's quite a contrast between between armitage who who has probably seen all types come in looking for the book and then he sees right. this guy who who yeah. uh who practices a form of magic i guess but right. uh, i mean gee at least it's not wilbur waitley right that's right <laughs> yeah the guard dog didn't attack him so right. I, I did like how you added the guard dog as well and uh yeah i went I, back i looked at the dunwich horror too because i thought well i need to be i should try to be consistent with this also yeah when uh when uh dexter and molly are sneaking back in uh did you uh did the process change at all for Blood of Balshandor, or was it pretty much similar to to Ira the Void? You you had a good idea going in what you were. I guess with the with the exception of that, you sort of had more 
background material that you had to be cognizant of? Well, with um, I had to do more rewriting with uh, of the Dexter Drake story, and, and the reason for that was, um, you know, something I guess I basically kind of just didn't understand, which is in the initial draft, um, Dex's relationship with Molly is uh, is much more um, in tone with the kind of the real historical nineteen you know twenties or nineteen twenties that it's it's sexism and um, I mean, I, I don't. I was still trying to portray him as a good guy, but I was trying to portray him as a good guy who would have the attitudes of, um, you know, the attitudes of the time. To me, it was kind of like a. You know, I was doing kind of a, you know, my gal Friday thing, you know, like the Cary Grant movie mm-hmm. or his gal Friday, and uh, and the there was the feedback I got from the from editorial was that um, Arkham Horror was. Well, this is my interpretation of what they said. They didn't say it in these words. I kept, these are kind of the words I said back to them. And they did kind of say, yeah, after I said this, um, was that um, although Arkham Horror uses all the uh, 1920s shtick to entertaining effect, and that's where it said, it's really not supposed to be a uh, completely accurate representation of the 1920s that characters particularly sympathetic sympathetic characters should have much more kind of woke 21st century values and, and, and behaviors and uh because you know we're, we're not writing about those less than desirable parts of the 1920s we're writing about cthulhu you know and, and people and, uh, and that's what people want to see not you know not your implied commentary on sexism or whatever so i had to do quite a bit of retooling of, of their relationship Mm-hmm. and the way he treats her and what he says to her and everything so that was um so, yeah. so that was that was the, the, the big difference between writing the two stories i guess yeah so I, I mean that relationship is pretty is is fairly central to central to the plot anyway and then central to uh, i guess i was kind of surprised when i saw like we my, uh, I think our first introduction to the book was was usually when they they will spoil it on the FFG website, and most people are interested in the cards that you that you get with the book uh, first, and so they had the Molly card, and I thought, oh, she's she's his stage assistant, but and then when I read the book, I was surprised how much they were they were more like partners and not so much. Um, you know, boss and an employee. Yeah, I think that that was, I think that was kind of um, there from the start, but but uh, there was a kind of a more superficial level where he treats her as an assistant and everything, and is and it is kind of sexist. And in the uh, the rewrite, we we brought out more front and center the fact that they are partners in in this adventure. And yeah, that, she's uh, she's, she's quite uh, Molly's quite sassy. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted her to be. Um, I, I felt like she was sassy in the first draft, but um, but 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 kind of in a more undercutting way that he doesn't entirely get. You know, <laughs> but and in, actually, in the rewrite we it made it more central and more um, yeah, more that he's much more cognizant that she's his equal. So, what was your what was your favorite scene in this uh, in this novella? Well, there's a scene where um, Dex conjures up the uh, spirit for uh, information. And I wanted that spirit to be like a really, really alien being, because I think a lot of times that's where the mythos stuff is the strongest, where you're not, not, oh, look, look, it's a fish man. But, you know, um, it's something that's like really challenges our whole idea of reality. And uh, so I wanted to do a being where it comes from a di- very different place. And when it arrives here, it brings kind of a bubble of that place with it. And in, within that bubble, um, conventional space and time start to break down. And, uh, but I also, it also had to be a scene where the, the Dex and the spirit could have a coherent conversation and Dex could get some vital information. So I had to um, try to portray reality breaking down, but yet still have this coherent conversation both at the same time. And I think it comes off pretty well. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the, that's one of my favorite scenes as well. And it's, and, and I can sort of see the challenge that you face there because you're, again, you know, when you're, when you're trying to have these sort of, uh, these mythos entities that are beyond space and time and, and are working on a, on a level that is way beyond us. Yeah. And yet that doesn't work particularly well when you're trying to convey important inter- information to readers about yeah. character motivation and, and where the yeah. story is going next. Yeah, I remember one of the suggestions from editorial was that uh, so you, you could make this like much more breaking down of space and time. And then it was like, yeah, but then you wouldn't understand the dialogue. <laughs> you know, or you'd have or every or you'd have the reader would have to sit there and you know spend 30 seconds unscrambling every line and i said that that wouldn't be any fun to read so we can't go quite that far yeah i know i i I think i mentioned in an email to you that when i when i was reading it i was i have this tendency to sort of skip down the page a little bit to see what was happening next and uh I think I did that a couple times in that scene and then I'm like no I've got to go back and cuz I was I was skipping past all the sort of the the information section and I was just getting the the breaking Weird. down of time and space the whole time and I'm like man there's this is a this is a crazy scene but I'm not sure what's going on and so I, I finally went I'm like no you got to slow down you got to read read the whole thing and and I'm like okay now there's there's the talking part that Right. where he he sort of explains what's uh what's going on um let me see where i am in my my list of questions here were there was uh there anything that you uh, cut from the book well like i said in that one there was there was a lot of there was rewriting because we wanted to you know get his uh 1920 sexism out of there and uh, there, that was one where we had, uh, where I, I had gone a little overboard with the, the combat and the, the chases, and we, we cut some of that. And, uh, you know, probably reads better for it. Mm-hmm. So, um, let me see. So what, uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of other mythos-related projects are you, uh, are you interested in tackling? Well, I would definitely, uh, you know, I definitely do more of these if they asked, or or do, uh, you know, full length uh, Arkham horror novels, which I know are done sometimes too. Uh, as far as uh, mythos stuff beyond that, you know, it's, it's just it's something I return to periodically when I get an idea. In fact, I've got a uh, short story sitting on my desktop of my computer right now that I wrote a week or so ago because it just was in my head to write it, which is a mythos story, and uh, I'm looking now trying to find well you know where could i uh, where's an appropriate market to send it well they're you know paid me a professional rate which is tricky to actually to find with a mythos story it's tricky even to find with just general horror but then if you a lot of horror markets for one reason or another say well we're not really looking for mythos stories so uh, eventually i'll have to figure out something to do with it yeah you'd mentioned uh, that the, but, the market collapsed sort of in the late yeah well the horror the market the, the horror market collapsed in the like a 89 90 around there it bounced back strong but there's a but mythos fiction seems to be kind of a uh kind of a niche within horror and uh there are a lot of places that uh, don't want it and there are a lot of other places that uh want it but they'll only pay you like a penny a word for a short story which i would like to do a little better than <laughs> yeah. um so i'm not sure what i'm going to do with it at this point and it, uh, I may just break down and send it to one of the penny word markets and just to get it out there because I'll get people to read it. Uh, I've done, I've, but I've, I've done a lot of mythos stories. I've got a uh, whole book of kind of my some of my best mythos stories called uh, The Hepcats of Ulthar, which uh, people can get on Amazon if they're interested. It's got, I don't know, a dozen, 14 stories in it, I think. Oh, cool. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I saw it on the on the list of uh, books that you'd written, but uh, I didn't realize it was a, a collection of uh, of fiction. Yeah, that's all. Um, yeah, that's all. All by it's not all my Lovecraftian stories, but it's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. So, what kind of other projects do you have on the go right now? Well, right now, uh, well, I've got two books that I'm are coming out in uh, October. And uh, the first one is the first uh, Marvel Legends of the Asgard novel 
from uh, Aconite Books, which is, I get, you guys probably know is affiliated with Asmodee and Fantasy Flight Games, and it's called The Head of Memer. And then towards the end of that month, uh, I've got uh, a book called uh, The Doom That Came to San Francisco, which is actually, although it plays on Lovecraft's Doom That Came to Sarna title, is actually not a mythos story. It's a uh, mutants and uh, mastermind superhero novel from uh, Green Ronin. And um, they, they, I'm, I'm usually not that great with titles. So they said, well, you know, what, what's a working title for this? And I said, The Doom That Came to San Francisco, never dreaming that that would be the final <laughs> title, but my editor really liked it, and so that's the title. And I, I guess I like it too, but I mean, I hope everybody will read it. I think it's a really fun story, but uh, it is actually not a Cthulhu Mythos story. For it. It's right. a title of Sail Under False Colors. Right. So what is the, what is the, the market out there like now for... For writing with the with the, the proliferation of other uh, other media out there I don't know I mean every writer's experience is different I mean I think that it's um, I mean I think that I, it's been I've been pretty lucky in terms of there are people that still want to publish books by me I mean, I've got uh, just yesterday I got a request for a uh, something will either be a short story or a novelette and uh looks like it'd be an interesting project and a good deal and i and uh i'm you know fingers crossed that i will get more offers to do uh marvel related books and mutants and masterminds related books and uh you know maybe some other things for those publishers too like uh, aconite books is um you know they're doing the marvel books and i feel tremendously lucky to have gotten in with them but i noticed that they're also doing full-length arkham horror novels too and if they ever Offer me one of those, I will certainly jump at it. So the have you have you played the card game? That is often the one of the questions people uh, ask. I know you've no, played. A, you, you, you're a D, you're I'm, a very experienced DM, and you've played Call of Cthulhu and whatnot. But but you haven't played the. I haven't played it. Fortunately, I will let people in on an ugly little secret of, of this kind of work, which is that um, writers often don't have to have played the games really to write the fiction that ties into the games. What you have to be able to do is you have to be able to look at the, um, at the world that's being simulated and understand that. It's like if you're writing a D and D based book, like a forgotten realms novel, you don't really have to understand how hit points work and armor class works and all that kind of, all those game conventions, that stuff can actually really get in your way and allow you and make you write a passage. That's like, very unrealistic, you know, because, you know, real human physiology isn't based on hit points, you know, it does, mm -hmm. that's not, it's not, it doesn't work that way, but you do have to understand, you know, on a fundamental level, what an elf is and what a dwarf is and that a red dragon breathes fire. And, and then, and that this is a, this is a heroic fantasy sword and sorcery kind of world. And uh, so, you know, no, I haven't read the card game, just like I never, had played World of Darkness games when I wrote World of Darkness fiction, <laughs> and uh, I've never played Mutants and Masterminds, although I've written Mutants and Masterminds fiction now. You don't, you really don't have to, but you do have to, you do have to get the spirit and the vibe of it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ever get the chance, Dexter has proved to be a very popular investigator with the, uh, with the community, and I, and I think that, uh, that you're, that your novella is is partly responsible for that because because uh, oh, cool. I know I certainly I I mean he's been a, a character in many of the Arkham Files properties for for many many years but uh, Dexter I never thought about playing him just because he was sort of your typical stage magician and I didn't really care about him all that much but now after reading after reading the novella you know, it really brings that character alive. And when you sit down to play the card game, you you have those scenes running through your head. And it, it really, I think it, I think I wish they would do more novellas because they really bring the characters alive. And, and I think they add something to the card game uh, besides just the, the cardboard. Well, I think that in general, that's something that, 
kind of more contemporary writers can bring to the table when they're tackling uh, the Cthulhu mythos is that, you know, Lovecraft had many strong qualities as a writer. He wasn't the greatest characterizer, you know, I mean, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't read um, uh, Lovecraft's story and come away and say, boy, that was a great character. You know, I we were really, really invested in that character and interested in what happened to him later. Uh, but in, uh, but now when we work with this stuff, we can try to create characters who are um, dynamic and interesting in their own, in their own right. And that you, that you form an attachment to whether we're writing all original stories or whether we're writing something like um, Arkham horror stories where we're trying to, bring a particular character to life. To me, that was a really important part of the, um, of the, um, the process of writing the novellas was there had to be a, um, you know, there had to be a character element above and beyond just, uh, well, here's a guy, he's confronting the mythos. And with Norman, it's, um, like I said, we pick him up at a very depressed and isolated point in his life and uh, explore that some and with dex it's you know the kind of the relationship with molly you know how he really feels about her and uh and how he feels about her versus ultimately versus his uh newfound commitment to you know by god keeping the lids on myth- keeping the lid on the mythos yeah i know that uh when they when they release the the bonus cards with the novella they have usually features cards that are related to the novella so dexter's art are Molly and and Yazteroth, mm-hmm. and uh, the official card that isn't uh, that's available in, in a main expansion uh, will be coming out later this year, and and the cards they're including with that one are just so much less interesting than the <laughs> ones you created. <laughs> I yeah. think the the one is. Well, called... I didn't actually create the cards. That was some. No, no, but the but the, yeah. the 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 characters. You know, when you right. I think mm-hmm. his one card is called Occult Scraps, and I'm like, I can see where you would get that in the book because he he does sort of he's picked up a lot of bits and pieces of the mythos over time, but. You know, it just doesn't have quite the same, uh, and I think his other card is called Showmanship, and I'm just like, right. it's not Molly? <laughs> <laughs> I want to play with Molly. I think Molly's really cool, and I think she's even cooler now that I've had it, you know, I've read the the novella, and when you slap that card down on the table, it's just like, you you know what her personality is like, and I think that that really uh, that's a credit to you as the writer that it brings out those sorts of feelings when you're when you're playing with these 10 cent pieces worth of uh, of cardboard yeah well that's really cool to hear thank you so we've got a, a few questions uh, coming in on the chat uh, uh, John Coxon is wondering which investigator would you uh, most like to write for sounds like you you've had a oh, choice I, oh man I haven't um... God, I haven't looked at the at the list other than the two I've already written for for so long that um, I'm kind of blanking on that. I mean, the the most honest answer I can give right at the moment is that uh, I'd be thrilled to do more with either Norman or Dex. Uh, and if I actually was looking at the list, I'm sure that they'd be popping at me and say, "Oh, that character is interesting. That character is interesting." But uh, you got to understand, I wrote these books a while ago, and I've gone on to the projects since, and I haven't gone back and looked at the, the reference material I have. So, you know, right. that's, that's not a very good answer, but it's best I can do. Can you give us a, a hint of what your sequel to Norman would uh, would include? Uh, yeah, I would. Um, I allude in the story to the fact that his. Uh, adult daughter is living in Hollywood and working in the 1920s film industry. And um, in the sequel that I had in mind, she would get into some kind of mythos related trouble, but also related to uh, 1920s uh, Hollywood. And he would go out to California and and, then try to bail her out. Oh, that sounds cool. Uh, George, uh, George Buzdagan, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, uh, from Romania, he was uh, wondering what your, uh, the names of your next uh, 
the next books that are coming out. Uh, you mentioned you've got two coming out in October. Yeah, well, there's there's uh, Marvel Legends of Asgard, the Head of Mimir, which is spelled M I M I R, and then there is the Doom that came to San Francisco. Uh, Wi-Fi 92 is uh, asking, he says he, he's seen that you've written uh, many stories set in the Forgotten Realms universe and uh, other fantasy settings. When developing a story and characters for the Arkham Horror setting, does your thought process change, and if so, how? Um, I think that it change, probably changes a little because you are... I mean, you want to make sure you kind of hit that horror vibe that there'll be some... Uh, moments which are uh, genuinely uh, scary or um, scary or, or, or very tense and suspenseful and but you know it doesn't really change all that much because um, I mean my fantasy has um, my fantasy has a lot of horror elements and my uh, horror, has a lot of kind of uh, adventure elements, you know, action fights and chases and stuff like that. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm shifting gears a little bit, but not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, K. H. McClure is asking, uh, what's your starting point in developing characters? Do you base them on as Do you base aspects of them on people from your real life? Very rarely. Um, I usually. I usually kind of have a story idea first, and uh, then I will um, kind of think, well, well, who's a, who's a, what would be a really interesting personality or background for a person that I have, uh, you know, kind of front and center dealing with this, and kind of build from there. And I mean, if, if there's something about someone I know in real life that seems relevant, yeah, I'll kind of probably bring it over in a, a disguise form, but I'm not real big on that. I'm not one of those writers that's constantly bringing uh, real people, the people that I know in real life into my fiction. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just not the way that I particularly work. Right, Did I answer so, all that? Well, I, think I, I think I got off track and maybe didn't answer the whole question there. What was... Uh, yeah, it was just whether you uh, do you base aspects of of your characters or what's your starting point in developing characters was the first part of the question. Oh, oh well, some okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a good example uh, or a couple examples. I did a I have a sword and sorcery character that I write about periodically, and uh, I wanted to do sword and sorcery stories which were kind of privatized stories, so I. Uh, so I was trying to try the well, what kind of character would kind of kind of credibly occupy that kind of fantasy Philip Marlowe, Sam Spade niche. So I had a um, so I came up with kind of a jaded uh, ex soldier who's fought in all these wars on this continent, and then has settled down into this um, has settled down into this. Uh, fantasy city that's full of intrigue and everything and, and sorcery and everything and he's um he's become a fencing master because that would um I, I have been a fencer so that was interesting to me and that he would i thought that would give him uh kind of credibility and cachet with um with the nobility but he would um he would not himself be of the nobility so he would constantly and he wouldn't have some kind of position that would make him unassailable if somebody wanted to mess with him. And uh, he would, um, you know, he he would have a kind of a side business because his fencing school didn't take off right away. Where he was, um, where he would kind of do uh, hire out do odd jobs as a, I'm, I'm a mercenary, but I won't fight in wars anymore. But I'll help you resolve this problem that you're having. And that all kind of, and then I kind of gave him this sort of very pragmatic uh going on cynical personality with all that because partly what with the private i think but partly because it made a nice contrast with kind of a high-blown uh nobility thing of a lot of his clients you know they, this other house has offended me and all that and uh so that was one character another character i did was um i've car a, a couple volumes in a post-apocalyptic superhero series called the imposter and it's a world where it's a superhero world where there's been an alien invasion 
and all the superheroes went out to fight it the invasion and they lost and they got killed and the aliens won but the super villains all kept their head down the heads down so they're still around and my character is a um my character is somebody who finds some of the uh gadgets which let super certain superheroes function as superheroes so he puts those on and kind of assumes those identities and goes out and starts trying to make things better and uh the whole point of that series was I had to have a character who was um, kind of an everyman because that was what made it interesting. He wasn't not, you know, he wasn't Bruce Wayne. He didn't trade from an early age to go out and do all this stuff. But on the other hand, he had to be smart and brave enough that he could actually succeed at some of the things he was doing. So I kind of created a character who was kind of a, you know, bright young man who'd worked as a manager of a sporting store and was kind of into athletics and, uh, kind of built from there so i guess the long, i guess the short form of that answer is that i i try to build characters who fit well with the story situation i'm going to put them in uh kh mcclure is also asking how much freedom do you feel to write your own story versus what the editors wanted it sounds like with the arkham horror books at least you've got quite a bit of freedom to what uh, it really varies i mean you've got um with the obviously when you're um when you're doing something that's totally your own, yeah, uh, you can kind of do whatever you want. Maybe finding a, a publisher that's willing to publish it afterwards might be another issue. But when you're doing all the uh, kind of shared world work for hire stuff, there's a lot of variation. Sometimes they want uh, say just write a story, a good story set in our world. Sometimes it's write a story set in our world that's about a particular character, like Norman or Dex. And sometimes it's you know write a particular story that's um, set in uh set in our world and it's about a particular character and you're going to tell the origin story of that character and so you know every every successive thing is more restrictive in some ways but there's still a lot of room for creativity because i mean they're hiring you because they want to see what you can do and uh and and see you take it to a place that uh maybe nobody in house would have thought to take it to that exact place so um i've i've never really felt horribly constrained by doing shared world stuff i enjoy it um i think that if um i, I think that with the way my mind works is if if i if it's something that i'm going to feel real constrained by or not enjoy doing my mind just never generates a pitch in the first place right right uh see here uh chad reverman says he feels the uh, the same way uh as i do as i did about dexter for him it's norman i never really cared for him but after the novella i have a real fondness for him so uh you uh, made at least one uh, norman convert uh, oh that's good to hear thank you uh andreas johansson was asking whether you played arkham yourself which we uh we know is not the case uh K.H. McClure was asking, when, uh, how did you get your first work published? Uh, did you get noticed through fan fiction or something else? No, I've never done fan fiction. I just, um, I just did it uh, the, by, uh, you know, starting to write some stories and then looking in writer's market and uh, said, oh, there's a market and uh, sending them off. And uh, that's still, I think, pretty much a way you can do it with you can do it with with short fiction although their writer's market it comes out like a once a year right so it's uh, it's often not uh it's often out of date that was that was back in the 80s when things were primitive you know now with um now with online you can find much more current uh, listings of, of fiction markets and but there and there are also ways to do it that are um much more um that will greatly improve your odds you, you can go to conventions and conferences and you can uh, you can meet people and uh if you're you know if you're not a jerk you know, <laughs> they, they will hopefully remember you and then when you send something you know, or a query letter or a story they'll say oh yeah i remember this guy he was okay i'll look at his story and uh and uh i, I guess some some people do um do break in kind of through fan fiction i mean i know it worked real good for stephanie meyer right mm -hmm. uh but uh i i just have never done that 
do they uh, do they still send uh, rejection letters? Oh God, yes. Yeah. Did you? Uh, uh, what was your worst one that you received? I don't know if there's one that I've never I've never gotten a really uh, I've never gotten a really brutal one. Even back at the start, I I would get the worst thing I would get was just like a form rejection. I don't know how often people really get really get brutal ones unless they really go out of their way to provoke them i mean you i think mostly they'd be they're happy just to send you the form rejection and let it go that you would have to send them one of those like really arrogant cover letters you know where if you don't buy this you're a fool or something like that to, to get them to make them care i think yeah i uh i think i have a a bad one because <laughs> i fancied myself a bit of a short story writer in my uh, in my teen teenage years uh and uh so i sent off a, a short story to a, a publisher that will remain unnamed and they sent me a rejection letter back that said we do not think english is your native language which is <laughs> yeah which is uh, well i'm yeah well, i'm sure there's some there's some nasty people out there but um um i mean sometimes i mean well that's obviously a gratuitously snide comment right I think sometimes people get um, detailed criticism that seems um, harsh to them, but um, if it isn't laced with comments like, we don't think English is your native language, uh, you should be open to the possibility that the editor is um, taking the time to give you a detailed critique as opposed to a form rejection because they think you have potential. Yeah. And they would like to see your writing get better. Yeah, I know. I, I see that uh, in my own work as a as a journalist and as an editor myself, and and having to deal with columnists and and uh, often uh, it happened several times where you know the columnists would send me material and and I would edit it, and then they would send me a letter saying, "Please don't edit my stuff," and it's just like it's not going in the paper the way it is so you got a choice <laughs> you can either accept an editor and everybody can use an editor yeah. or or not write yeah my um the attitude that i've come to with with editors is basically that you don't you don't sweat the small stuff you know if um, if somebody wants to make a change in your story that is that is that you don't think is helpful but it doesn't hurt it that much either you know fine you know, uh, once in a while you know, somebody will suggest a change or make a change that you really feel kind of kills what you were trying to do and then you have to come back and say let's talk about this and generally in my experience you and the editor will come to some kind of a compromise solution because they'll they'll remain convinced that what you initially did doesn't work, and you'll remain convinced that what they initially did didn't wasn't work. But you'll find a place where you can meet in the middle, and that, that probably is the thing that, that works when the when the readers actually find it. Mm -hmm. uh, Tress Million is asking, what do you think Norman and Dexter would think of each other if they met for the first time? <laughs> Well, Dex would probably think Norman was kind of a stick in the mud, and uh, and uh, Norman would probably think that Dex was kind of uh, would kind of cue into the sort of the uh, the, the, the 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 flashy uh, brash aspects of his personality and see him as much more of a lightweight than he really is. But I think they'd probably get past that fairly quickly, you know, given their their shared interests and things, and given that they really both do are made of the right stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe a, maybe you can uh, put together a team up novel or something like that. <laughs> that would be interesting because they do have different strengths. We've got uh, one more question from Cage McClure. Is there? Uh... Is there any? Is there an already established universe that you have yet to write for that uh, sounds interesting to you? Oh, gee. Uh, well, I've never done it. I've said I've done things in the, in the the Marvel universe, including my forthcoming book. But uh, I've never done anything in the DC universe, despite being a DC fan. Also, so uh, 
yeah, like a Batman story or Green Lantern story, it would be cool. Or the mystical part of that universe. I like this the the Spectre and the Phantom Stranger and all those cats. Um, I think of something that's that's not comic book specifically. I mean, there's a lot of interesting movie franchises. I mean, if somebody said you you should write an if you want to write an aliens book or do you want to write a predator book, I'd be happy to do that. Or um you know, sometimes I mean Conan is a character that has had a kajillion pastiches and I'd be happy to throw one of mine on the pile. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> if 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 I ever got the chance. I've uh, I'm from teenage years on I've been a big sword and sword and sorcery fan. I like uh, Conan, I like the Master and Fawford, I like uh Carl Edward Wagner's Kane, I like Morcox Elric, all that stuff. CL Moore's uh Gerald of Jory, all that stuff. All right. If there oh, uh... I, I, I thought of one more. Okay. I I I one of the the first writer fantastic writers that I got into and just absolutely idolized as a kid was uh Burroughs. So I'd be thrilled to do a like a Barson book or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cage McClure says, very cool. Thank you for the time. And uh, thanks for the great answers. Oh, well, no problem. Glad to be here. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, if you want to post them in the chat, uh, do so now. Otherwise, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap things up and uh, and uh, Richard can get back to, to pounding out the 1,500 words a day and and uh or writing this or watching the second season of the umbrella academy it's kind of a (laughs) (laughs) toss-up well yeah no i I haven't even watched the first season yet so i'm i'm still trying to make my way through star trek deep space nine uh yeah it doesn't look like we've got any more questions so uh thank you uh so much richard for uh for joining me today here it's been a real a pleasure, pleasure. To, uh, to talk to you and uh, look forward to uh, hopefully more uh, Arkham Horror novellas in the future. It would be great to see uh, the the two characters that you have done have certainly uh, grown on me since uh, reading the novellas. And it would be, uh, there, are, uh, there are quite a few out there that uh, could use a little love, I think. Yeah, I'd love to do more. So we'll just see what happens. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's going to do it for this uh, live stream, uh, the uh, Chance Encounter with uh, Richard Lee Beyer. Thanks again to Richard for for joining us here today. Just a reminder that there is a ton of uh, Farcom Con uh, activities uh, taking place right now. You can head over to the uh, the Farcom Con website and uh, find out uh, what is uh, what is planned. uh, this afternoon, I'm just going to take a quick peek here, and uh, we'll take a we'll look at uh, the schedule uh, that uh, what's coming up. Uh, July 31st. Let's see at uh, what time is it now? It is 12:15. So the uh, Arkham, uh, the Mythos Busters just started another one of their adversarial drafts. Uh, later this afternoon, the Great Old Ones Gaming are having a Pulp Cthulhu Forgotten Age playthrough. Uh, Nate Lost in Time and Space has put together his interpretation of the first two scenarios from the Forgotten Age campaign for Pulp Cthulhu. I am a a very sad panda that I don't get to play in uh, that particular game, although it looks like Nate is going to be offering a second game on Sunday morning, so if uh, you are interested in getting in on that and uh, playing uh, with myself and uh, and Nathan uh, early from... uh, from Great Old Ones Gaming, uh, uh, hit up uh, Nate over on the uh, the Discord channel. The uh, optimal play has ultimatum of uh, crowdsourced chaos at uh, 3:30 my time, uh, and this evening we have uh, the Mythos Busters patron event at four o'clock, and uh, the big one, the Mythos Busters live recording, an evening with uh, Matt Newman and Jeremy Zorn, the uh, designers of the Arkham Horror LCG. So uh, check those out. That should be a a, a great time. Just another reminder to uh, head over to my Facebook page, the Whisper in Darkness channel, and uh, post a picture of your tentacle tentacle face with the hashtag MyTentacleFace to uh, 
enter for uh, many prizes. We've got the Investigator Starter Decks, the Return to the Forgotten Age upgrade, the Barkham Horror, and uh, the Blood of Belshandor signed by Richard Lee Beyer uh, are available. And uh, I will be back tomorrow with the uh, Whisper in Darkness listener event. I've got a couple of, uh, of guests coming on. We'll chat about... Uh, the state of Arkham Horror, the community, and whatnot, and uh, it should be a great time. So I, if you enjoy the channel, I hope that you uh, will uh, tune in for that and uh, say hello to uh, to myself and, uh, and my special guests. Thanks again, Richard. I will let you go, and I hope you have a fantastic day. You too. <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode. If you enjoyed what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you need to contact me, I can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com. I am also on Twitter at manfromlang. Until the stars are right, keep your shotgun close and your all design closer. Take care out there, and happy 